today I open up by just wanting to say a few words about an event that happened here in Michigan on Monday. I got a call about 8.30 from my son who goes to Michigan State University letting me know that there was an active shooter on campus. As you can imagine, as a parent, uh, knowing that your son or daughter is in that kind of situation, it becomes very, very, very scary. Um, I can't imagine being a student on campus when that happened, and I surely can't imagine being a parent who lost a child during that time. So I just wanted to say that as a world, we have to do better. As individuals, we have to do better. As Christians, we have to do better. We have to love. Love is the only way to defeat this, the hate that seems to have taken over our country. But I just want to give a shout out to all those people who are suffering right now and just want to just take a small moment. I have a, a, a mentor. Uh, you guys probably know her. I've had her on our Sunday schools before. She's a professor there. So I know a lot of people connected and a lot of people who are traumatized by this event. Please keep them in your prayers and uh, let's try to make some changes in our lives. How do you respond with someone who doesn't look like you walks into your church? How do you receive them? Do you see whispers starting to go on throughout the church? Or do you welcome them with open arms? Today, James, the half-brother of Jesus, gives us a hard lesson on the rich and the poor. Missionary Baptist Church, where my father, Wallace Hill the fourth, the, excuse me, Wallace Hill the third, is the pastor. Now, it's an honor for me for you to take time out of your busy schedule each week to join me for the Sunday school lessons based on the International Lesson Series. And for those of you that are new, do me a favor: go down to the bottom of the page and click the subscribe button, then click that little bell right next to it. And each week, you'll be notified. Ding, ding, ding! The deep has uploaded another lesson. Now the goal of Sunday School with the Deke is to bring the Word of God to life, in your life, and to give you an understanding of the scriptures and make the Word of God real and interesting and an integral part of your day-to-day -day being. Ultimately, I would hope that these lessons will inspire those who don't have a relationship with Christ to come asking, what must I do to be saved? Today, we're coming down to the home stretch of our winter quarter. We have this week's lesson and then next week's lesson and then we'll be done. And then we'll head into our spring quarter. Now today we're in the book of James. James was the half brother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. James is the first uh, in a group of epistles or letters uh, called the general epistles. Now an epistle is just another word for a letter written to a church. Um, uh, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude were all general epistles. Now, they, that means they, uh, well, like Paul, Paul wrote epistles specifically to specific churches like Thessala Thessalonica or Philippi or Rome or Ephesus or Corinth. You know, that's where you get Thessalonians, Philippians, Romans, uh, Ephesians, Corinthians, and so on. But these general epistles are not directed at a particular church or a particular individual. 
uh, but to the church, the Christian church as a whole. That's why the general epistles. James' uh, emphasis is on faith and what faith produces. Now, James believed that genuine faith in Jesus Christ results in genuinely changed lives. Those who have um, been saved by God and truly believe and, and have accepted him uh, and they receive the gift, gift of salvation um, are expected to act out that trust while making choices about their lives and their actions. Um, in other words, according to James, belief which le leads to no change or no works is not really saving faith. Uh, the works don't save you, but they do reveal the character of your trust in God. So what does that look like in our daily lives? James, uh, in the first chapter, um, commented or, or commanded us to live out the words of God. He compared the uh, absurdity, and I read this verse last week, of hearing the word, then ignoring it, to a man looking at his face in the mirror and then immediately forgetting what he looks like. So here in James chapter 2, he urges us not to show favoritism or partiality. As a specific example, he's going to um, refer to rich people uh, or poor people that might come into a Christian gathering. So let's get into the lesson, um, but before I do, I have to say this. Our lesson date is February 19th, 2023. Our lesson text is James chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Our lesson title is, uh, is the rich and the poor. <laughs> you can tell this is live. Uh, grab your Bibles, grab your books. Grab your pens, grab your paper, and let's get into today's lesson. Verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Now James opens up chapter 2 with my brethren. Now, even though James was trying to correct the behavior of us, he still wants to do it out of love the love of Jesus Christ. Now, we as Christians should be able to receive Christian guidance a little bit better. Some people don't want to hear nothing from nobody. They don't believe, you know, even if they know they got your best interest in mind, we still don't, don't want to hear it um, from a Christian to another Christian, um, especially when it goes against how you want to act at the time, right? But we should all be trying to do a little bit better. After James calls them brethren, he jumps right into the point that he's trying to make beginning in this chapter, uh, which is about partiality. He says, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ? In other words, how can you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ when you, don't show, when you show respect to persons? Uh, this is just another way of saying you have to respect all people the same way. You can't favor one person over another. This is why you heard this term in the Old Testament. Um, in the New Testament, Peter tells us the same thing in Acts 10 and, 14, uh, 10 and 34. Uh, God is not a respecter of persons. He may, he may bless us differently, but he loves us all the same. He doesn't love me more than he loves you. What James is saying here is you can't profess the faith of Jesus Christ and then act like a spiritual snob. You know, we can't be all cliquish in our church. We're supposed to all be in this together. This should be a love of Christ that binds us, right? That's what I love about our church. I truly believe that this is the case at our church. You know, James is addressing the Christian community as a whole. He's not talking to a specific church, like I told you earlier. We need to understand the lay of the land um, to understand when, how this, when this letter was written. James wrote this at a time where being partial was like, this was just part of life, right? 
And it's still that way today. People were uh, filled with prejudice uh, or hatred based on your class or your ethnicity or your nationality or your religious background. And now in 2023, what is it? It's based on whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. It's like it's, it, your prejudices are based off of being around people who you associate yourself with. But at the time when, Jesus, when James wrote this, uh, people were categorized as either Jew or Gentile, either slave or free, or rich or poor, or uh, Greek or barbarian, or whatever. One of the main things Jesus tried to do when he was on this earth was to break down all those walls that divided humanity. And to try to bring forth a new race, a, a human race. Uh, so it made it hard for the church on the inside when the walls of separation were so prevalent on the outside, right? So we want to be all in our different camps outside the church and then it makes it hard for us when we come inside the church to be all together. Um, can you imagine being a slave uh, or ex-slave and you sitting in church right next to your master it'd be hard to be seen as equal uh, in God's house when on the outside you weren't equal so I think this is why we find so many churches filled with like-minded people um, maybe the church is filled with one race or maybe the church is filled with people who have certain financial statuses uh, you know, it makes us more comfortable. Uh, and that's why when we see political leaders uh, or Christian leaders putting barriers between people based on their race or ethnicity or class, that's not of Christ. I don't care how many evangelical names you put in front of you. If you're trying to separate people or if you're trying to, to treat certain people better than others, then that's not of Christ. We are all one in the body of Christ. There is no separation. There is no respect to persons. You know, if you belong to the Lord and another person belongs to the Lord, he is your brother. Let's go to verse 2. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and then come in also a poor man in vile raiment. Uh, now, James was going to give an example here uh, of the kind of partiality that we don't, that has no place in Christianity, right? He says, if a man comes into your assembly, which he uses the word assembly, which he means synagogue, uh, and the fact that James calls it a, uh, uh, calls a Christian meeting a, meeting a synagogue, you know, shows you that he wrote this in the early church where before Gentiles really were even brought into the church. Um, so it's probably filled with mostly new converted Jewish Christians. Um, but for purposes of, uh, uh, of what we're doing today, you can replace synagogue with the word church. Why don't we do that? So a place where, you know, we all come for the same thing, for one purpose. Uh, so a man comes in with a gold ring and walks through the door. Gold ring didn't mean a single ring, but it was loaded, Mr. T style, with gold rings, which was, which was a sign of wealth. And this, this showed the, that the man was rich. Now, in Roman society, the wealthy, they wore many rings on their left hand, which was, uh, again, like I said, a sign of wealth. If you knew a person, um, you would know a person who was rich just by the jewelry they had on. Uh, uh, it was like rappers in the 80s, you know, Run DMC and Eric B and Rakim, and uh, they were just draping in gold, right? Uh, but, you know, the type of gold rings that we're talking about here that walks into church would almost be considered gaudy to us. So, so the next part of the verse says, uh, and he had on goodly apparel, which means he had on, you know, fine clothes or bright clothes uh, made out of very fine linen. Um, now he's going to contrast it here by another man that walks through the door, a poor man. The Greek word used here for poor signifies he was very poor. I remember back in the day when you had to get sugar shop to go to church. 
And honestly, there's still some places like that. Uh, some people just can't imagine going into a church in anything other than a suit or a long dress. And that's fine. Um, uh, and last week, our, our minister that, that preached at our church, that, our associate minister, uh, Sanders, he preached at our church. He had on a sweatsuit that said, God first, right? And I was loving it. You know, I'm so glad our pastor released us from the shackle of, uh, uh, of what you wear. You know, but you should still want to look nice. Um, here we have a case where a rich man walks into church and is surrounded by uh, so much pomp and circumstance that I'm sure everyone uh, was in awe when he went to take his seat. In contrast, you have this poor man, you know, that comes into the church in tattered clothes and torn clothes. The Bible says vile raiment. Uh, you know, even if the clothes were clean, is still evidence of his poverty. So James here tries to show the two extremes of the two men that walk through the church. A lot of times we seem to put a lot of emphasis on outer appearances. And there's a lot of danger in putting so much emphasis on clothes. You know, we got to be careful where we place our treasures. You know, I can actually appreciate pastor, our pastor, uh, when he, you know, it looks like me and you, or drives what I drive, uh, and not something that I could ever hope to drive for, you know. God spreads his love among all people, whether you're rich or poor, or dark or light, or white or black, you know, goodly clothing or vile raiment. But be careful how you treat people because you could be entertaining angels unaware. When it comes to Christ, we all stand on the same plane. Riches don't get you no closer to God than it does being poor. And being poor doesn't uh, set you farther from God, right? So, you know, to favor a rich man uh, in the way James is describing here shows a deeper meaning among Christians. You know, we can't get hung up on worldly things or fleshly things. We can't show partiality, uh, you know, that we care more for outward appearance than we do about the hearts of a man. You know, Samuel wrote, wrote in 1 Samuel 6 and 17, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God looks at the heart and we should too. To show partiality shows, you know, that we misunderstand what's important um, or what's blessed in the sight of God. When we assume that the rich man is more important to God or more blessed by God, we put way too much meaning uh, on material things. To show partiality shows a selfish streak in us. You're probably like, how is that? You know. Usually we favor a rich man over a poor man because we believe we could get more out of that rich man than we can the poor man. You know, he can do favors for us that the poor man can't, you know, or we might get the hookup. You know what I'm saying? Let's go to verse three. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing and say unto him, sit down here in a good place and say to the poor man, stand over there or sit here under my footstool. So, so look what happens when, when, uh, when the two people walk into the church. They say to the rich man, hey, come on, sit down front. Come on, sit down here. I can make a place for you. Uh, sister so-and-so, move over so he can sit here, you know, that type of thing. Um, you know, uh, move his sister, uh, sister front pew out the way so we can put this man and show him some respect. And wiping down his seat and saying, you know, can I get you something? You need some water or something, you know. Um, you can't say to the rich man, here, take my seat, or here, let me find you a spot, or give him a special treatment just to show favoritism. You can't treat people different based on their outward appearances. You can't neglect the poor man or show contempt for him because he doesn't look like you. You know, a footstool, uh, in this verse it says, sitting on my footstool, means to sit below you, like on the ground. But it doesn't stop here. Sometimes we discriminate based on looks. 
Think about it. If a fine woman come walking into church, empty-handed, fellas, we opening doors and say, can I get you some coffee and stuff like that? You know, here, let me get that door for you. Um, but if a tender-eyed woman walks in, <laughs> now don't blame me for that term. Brother Moses used that term in the book of Genesis when he was describing Leah. If you look at Genesis 29 and 17, uh, look at it in your spare time. Uh, I guess he was trying to be nice in how he was describe somebody who was not so pretty, right? Uh, I guess, uh, and I, I'm assuming that, I guess if your eye was tender, uh, you know, it's always, you know, looking like that. <laughs> so if a tender-eyed woman walks in with four little snotty-nosed kids and, you know, three diaper bags, you know, she left to fend for herself. She can't even get the door open, you know, ain't nobody hardly helping her or nothing. Uh, but the, 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 the fine woman come walking in, you know, everybody trying to help. You know, now James is going to show us uh, the greatest sin here in, in verse 4 and 5. Let's go to 4. Are ye not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Uh, uh, the New Living Translation of this verse says, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives. Now James stops right here and says, aren't you actually being partial in yourselves or aren't you making discriminations among yourselves and being judges? You know, aren't you discriminating? Aren't you dividing uh, in your own mind? Aren't you double, being double-minded? Aren't you showing um, preferential treatment, saying this person is better than that person? Simply by their, their visual appearance. You know, let's be honest. The poor man could be a jerk. Uh, he could be a right flat out jerk. But here, we simply state how you treat people based on looks. Have you uh, not treated them different? You know? We would like to think that this picture that James is painting is over-exaggerated. But it's, you know... You know, we would think that it would seem like a stretch that people would act this way, especially in a church. But when we look into our own heart, we will see that we, we, we do this a lot, right? We often make discriminations among ourselves and basically become, uh, like James says, judges with evil thoughts. You know, you look at things and, 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 uh, that are seen instead of those things that are not seen. This is contrary to God. Let's go to verse 5. Hearken, my brother, my beloved brother. Have not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Again, like I said earlier, James is talking to Christians. He, taught, he calls them brother because his heart, uh, his heart, uh, and his heart, they are his brother. And that's why he's trying to correct their behavior. He says, have not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, uh, and heirs of the kingdom? You know, it may be easy for us to, to be partial to rich people, but God isn't partial to them, right? In fact, since riches are an obstacle to the kingdom of God, Jesus told us in Matthew um, 19 and 24 that uh, you know that 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 riches was an obstacle to get into to get into heaven, right? Um, it, I'm not saying that rich riches can't get you in heaven. I'm saying it's an obstacle. Um, there's a sense in which God especially blesses the poor. Um, James says they are chosen to be rich in faith because the poor of this world simply they. They have more opportunities to trust God, right? Therefore, they just might be far more rich in faith than a rich man. Because a rich man can depend on his money in a, in a lot of situations. Now, health, that's a, you know, even in health, you can get be the best doctors with money. So you can trust in your money more than you trust in God. Therefore, the rich, I mean, uh, the poor just might be more rich in faith than the rich man. Uh, that's all that he's saying here in this verse. He said the rich man may trust 
God, but the poor man must trust God. Uh, the poor man has nothing to hide, uh, nothing to hide behind, except the two strong arms of God. The rich man, he can hide behind his money. Now think about this. We can say that God has chosen the poor uh, in the sense that when he volunteered to leave his, his divine palace in heaven <clears throat> and came to earth, when he came to earth, he wrapped himself in human flesh and he came into poverty. He chose to be born into poverty. Born in a stable with cows and pigs and chickens. You know, there's nothing that men dread more than poverty. You know, we'll break every commandment in the book rather than be poor. But God uh, chose this lot for his son when he came down here on earth. He had one opportunity of living our life. And he chose to be born in uh, a parents, uh, too poor to give, you know, uh, uh, two doves in the temple. A poor man could be looked down on in certain churches or even uh, our church for that matter. But that person could be the richest person spiritually in the church. The word of God talks an awful lot about the poor. God makes it clear from Genesis to Revelation, that he is concerned for the poor. The poor never seems to get a fair break in this world. And, you know, their only hope is in Jesus Christ. Psalm 69 and 33 says, For the Lord heareth the poor. Psalm 72, 12 and 13 says, For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no help. He shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. Psalms 102 and 17 says, He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. Isaiah 11 and 4 says, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So God has a great deal to say about uh, the mistreatment of the poor. Someday, those folks will have to answer to him, the people who mistreat the poor. This is why I'm so concerned for our country. You know, when we went through the pandemic, it, it buckled us. You know, people who never thought that they would have to sit in a food line, spend hours waiting for a meal. People um, who had perfectly good jobs up until when the pandemic hit, they lost them. They found themselves, you know, not knowing where their next meal was coming from. In these cases, you just can't sit idly by and watch. You know, you can't watch somebody need and not do anything if you're a Christian. If you have the means to help somebody, you know, Christ requires that we do it. Your faith should produce works. That's what James is saying. Okay, let me get off my high force. I digress. Verse 6. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? James is just telling the truth here. For the most part, the rich do despise the poor. Let's think about it. Whether it's corporations or politicians or whoever, they stand on the backs of the common person. You know, we get, we get bonuses sometimes at work. Um, but it's pennies compared to what those at the top get, you know, pennies compared to the ones that put the work in, you know, politicians want to take unemployment benefits away. They want to prevent people from having health care. But guess what? The people that, that need it are the ones that are the poor. Politicians, they have health care for the rest of their lives, even when they're out of office, just because they served the term, you know taking away food stamps or taking away social security, you know, and the list goes on. They, why do they want to do this to, to poor people? It doesn't matter who's in office, nothing seems to change. The only poor, uh, hope that the poor has is in Christ. The very people who you should be, uh, the very people who you be jocking when they come in your midst are the same ones who are trying to oppress you. 
you know, keeping you from promotions behind closed doors, while you, you know, um, while you despising the poor yourself. You know, you know, you don't realize you're poor whether you know it or not. <laughs> James asked the question here: Do do rich do rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? He's reminding us that the rich often sin against or oppressed against us. Um, this is often because the love of money is the root of all evil. That's what Paul told us in 1 Timothy 6 and 10. James says, for this reason alone, the rich are not worthy of the partiality that you show them. You know, because they're going to they gonna put you down every chance they get. Respecting persons on account of riches or outward appearance is a great sin. Verse 7, do not they blaspheme the worthy name by which ye are called? You know, those same rich folks blaspheme, blaspheme the honorable and worthy name of Jesus Christ. When you mistreat the poor, you blaspheme in the name of Christ. The very God that you go to church to praise and worship, these men profane your religion and try to get others to profane it as well. This makes your sin to be foolish by propping them up, right? <laughs> that very thing that tends to pull you down and dishonor the uh, worthy name of Christ by whose name you called. Now, how do we fix this? Let's go to verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. Now, James ain't no dummy here. James knows how the church folks are. So James anticipated that some of the readers might defend their partiality. They're going to defend their partiality uh, to the rich man by saying, hey, I'm simply loving the rich man, you know, as my neighbor in obedience, you know, to the law. The problem is that you are, the problem is not that you're nice to the rich man. The problem is that you can't only show partiality to the rich man and not be nice to the poor man. So you can't say, you can't excuse your partiality by saying, I'm just fulfilling the command of, to love my neighbor as myself. James says it's simple. If you fulfill the royal law, then you won't have any issues. Now, what is the royal law? Love your neighbor as yourself. James says, if you do this, then you do well. You know, if you want to please God to obey him, you know, in his royal law, then treat your neighbor as yourself. You know, we must institute the law of love towards me. And I did my opening, my opening, talking about that shooting. I said, we got to love more. Yo, if we want to please God, that's what we need to do. James makes it clear here that you need to love your neighbor as yourself. And then you will do well. The royal law is fulfilled when you don't have a respect for persons. The royal law forbids the kind of selfish exploitation of others. It teaches us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Let's go to verse 9. But if you have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as a transgressor. New Living, New Living Translation of that verse says, But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law, the royal law. So, so here in verse 9, James gives us a but, a big but. <laughs> Some of us like big buts, uh, but not this kind of big but. James says, but if you show respect of persons, what happens? The law condemns discriminating between rich and poor. You are against God. You are guilty. Some might say, well, I haven't committed a murder or I haven't committed a adultery or let's uh, uh, go. To, I guess we'll see something in verse 10 that will help us with that. The royal law should convict you to do right by people because it, it teaches you to see yourself in that person, right? Or in that poor person. You can see yourself. Uh, 
in that poor person, just like you could see yourself being rich. A lot of us could see ourselves as being rich, but none of us can see ourselves as being poor. So to show partiality is a violation of the royal law. It's both a sin and a transgression. Sin is a lack of um, a lack of conformity to the will of God. So when you don't conform to the will of God, that's a sin. Any failure to meet his standards, right? A transgression is breaking of a known law. Some things are sinful because they are, you know, inherently wrong. But they become transgressions when there's a specific law against it, right? So partiality is sinful because essentially it's wrong in itself. But it's also a transgression because God gave us a law against it, right? James is not going to show us how ser uh, the seriousness of obeying all of God's commands. Let's go to verse 10. For whosoever, and 11, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of it all. Verse 11, for he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, but if you kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So, James here is saying, he's trying to help us. Uh, to guard against being a you know, selective obedience. That's what he's trying to do here. He's talking about picking and choosing which commands of God we should, should obey and which ones we should disregard. He, he, we can't say, I like God's command against murder, uh, so I'll keep that one. Um, but I don't like his command against adultery, so I'll disregard that one. You know, God cares about the whole law. Um, James is just not saying... Um, if you break one commandment, then you break them all. He's not saying that. He is saying that you, you are guilty of breaking the, the entire, you know, the commandments, no matter which one it is. You know, a prisoner was in a cell for raping somebody. And he looks across uh, in the next cell and sees a man serving time for murdering somebody. The raper says, well, at least I didn't murder anybody. You know, but guess what? Y'all both in jail. <laughs> you, uh, you hear about prisoners beating up people for, uh, or killing people because of the crime that person did was worse than theirs. You know, if a, a child molester's in there and a bank robber's in there, they want to get on the, the, the child molester uh, because of the, his crime was worse than the other. But both of y'all, all y'all in jail, right? Um, um, well, and, and we do the same thing in our churches, in our homes, in our family, and we got to uh, guard against that. You can't look down on somebody because of their sin, because you think your sin is better than their sin. Uh, we're all guilty of breaking the law of Christ, no matter what yours is. You know, we, we look down on so many sins, like that's just the worst thing in the world. But then you got your own sins, right? Yeah, you may not ever be, you may be married and never be attracted to another person, it, but you want to look down on somebody that has fought, fell into that trap. But you go through all kinds, you know, you got all kinds of issues. You don't treat people good. You, you, you uh, gossip all the time. And, I mean, all these things, you can't be a, you can't sit there and act like your sins are better than other people's sins. <laughs> to, to break one law makes you a lawbreaker, right? No matter what it is. The Pharisees tried to trap Jesus for doing things on the Sabbath. But they lied, they stole, they murdered, they did all kinds of stuff. But they didn't break the Sabbath, right? <laughs> they were so hypocritical. You can't look at one part of the royal law as being any more important or less important than the other part. I have to stop right here and clarify something in verse 11. James uses the example of adultery and murder in his letter that is clearly written to Christians. You know, adultery and murder are part of the Ten Commandments that Moses gave to the Israelites. We as Christians are not under that Mosaic law, but we're under the law of grace. So it seems that James is still struggling here with, you know, to shake loose some of those old Jewish ways or Jewish patterns. 
Paul tells us in Romans 6 and 14, you are not under the law, but under grace. So he tells the Romans in 7 and 6 that you have been delivered from the law. Romans 7 and 4 says you are dead to the law. Also in Galatians, you can see it. Galatians 2 and 19, Galatians 3 and 13, Galatians 3 and 24, Galatians 3 and 25, 1 Timothy 1 and 8, um, Hebrews 7 and 19. The fact that Christians are not under the Ten Commandments is clearly stated in 2 Corinthians uh, 3, 7 through 11. But we are under the royal law, which James does state here, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do that, you will never break any of the Ten Commandments. I just threw that in there for free. <laughs> Let's keep on moving. Last verse, verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. This is, this is um, the same James that writes, uh, be a doer of the word and not a hearer of the word. So not only speak it, but do it. The law of liberty is the law of Christ. It's not the Mosaic law. You know, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he says in John 14 and uh, 15. He also said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's John 15 and 12. Christians will be held to the law of Christ. We should conduct ourselves by the law of Christ. It has liberty, which is freedom. It does have liberty, yet it's still a law. That has to be obeyed. Liberty simply means freedom. God gives us liberty. You have the freedom to do what is right. He doesn't force you to do anything. Now the law of Moses uh, required you to love your neighbor. But it didn't give you the power to love your neighbor. You know, and, and you, it condemned you if you failed. Now under the law of grace, which we're under, you are given the power to do it through the Holy Spirit. You know, and we, and we are rewarded when we do it. But if we profess Christ, then he says, um, people will know who we are by the way that we love. James finishes this verse by saying that they shall be judged by the law of liberty. We will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he have done, whether it be good or bad. So you got to understand that someday we're going to have to face Christ and explain all the things that we did. So we should try to love. We should try to treat people good. If you, if you aren't that type of person and you call yourself a Christian, you need to do a self-evaluation. We should always love. We should always be forgiving. We should always, you know, not hold grudges against people that last a lifetime. If we can do some of these things, then we won't find people shooting up school kids, and little children. This is the end of our lesson for today. But let me ask you a few questions. Do you show more kindness to those of your own race than those of other races? Ouch. You know, some of us do, some of us are guilty of those things. Are we more kindly, um, do we treat people that are younger better than we treat people that are older? Are we more outgoing to the good looking people than those who are plain or homely looking? Are we more anxious to be friends with somebody who's prominent um, than those that are unknown? Do we avoid people with physical infirmities and, 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 and seek the companionship of, of the people who are strong and healthy? Do you favor the rich over the poor? Do you get a cold shoulder to foreigners who speak, who don't speak our language? Um, and here's a good one. Do you treat people outside your home better than the ones you treat inside your home? We have all snapped on our husband or wife 
or our kids. Um, and somebody outside the house does the same thing and it's all good. Do the same thing to us and it's all good, right? Our husband, wife, or kids do it to us. We snap. Somebody outside the house do it to us and we don't say anything. It's something to think about. So, if you do any of these things, uh, you're not where God wants you to be. So, let's remember favoritism is, is a foreign in the example of Jesus Christ. There's no place uh, in Christianity for discrimination uh, or contempt for others because of their race or their sex or their poverty. Uh, the poor has been chosen by God to be rich in faith and we dishonor God when we dishonor those that he honors. So that's the end of our lesson for today. Next week our lesson will be from the book of uh, James. No, it won't. I don't know what it is. I didn't put it in my notes. Uh, but I will put it on the screen, okay? So um, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button, comment, and share. Your comments help me, and your sharing the lesson will help others. Let's dismiss. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Spartan strong.